So today we're going to illustrate how to analyze data from the Stanford Open Policing Project. And in order to do this, we're actually going to read in real data from one state, and we're going to run through some of the basic analyses that you might do on it using R. So let's start by actually loading in the libraries that we need. We rely on the tidyverse libraries. Now we're going to read in the data for a single state. So importantly, when we originally got the data for this project, it was in a different form for every single state. And this is because each police department in each state has its own recording conventions. But that raw data is very difficult to work with, so we took it and we put it into a standardized form, which is consistent across states, to make it easier for other researchers to analyze multiple states simultaneously and understand what was going on. So today we're going to be working with that standardized data because it's much easier to work with, although of course you can analyze the raw data too if you're interested. So let's read in the data for a state. We're going to be using Connecticut as an example for two reasons. First, it's small, so it loads quickly, but it still has quite complete data, giving us a rich set of fields to analyze that sort of gives you a sense for the potential of this data. So let's just take a quick look at the data before we do anything else. I'm going to run through the columns quite quickly because there's a more complete description online, but let's just give you a sense of what the data looks like. Each row in this data represents one stop, records information for one stop. First we have an ID, unique for every stop, the state in which the stop occurred, and the date and the time of the stop. Now let's talk a little bit about these fields which are labeled raw. The suffix raw indicates that that's the original data from which the standardized information was inferred. So here you see we have a field called county name, and this is the standardized county name which will be in a consistent format across states. But we also wanted to provide you with the raw data from which we inferred this standardized county name. So in this case you see that we have Westport and this has been mapped to Fairfield County. And the reason we provide you with this raw information is to be very transparent about the process we used in mapping so that if you disagree or if you have different purposes that you're trying to use the data for, you can take that raw data in an easy way and do whatever you want with it. We also have the FIPS code, um, which refers to the FIPS code of the county in which the stop occurred the fine grain location, so as you can see this is not going to be in a standardized format across states or even really within state, the police department, which is always state police because these are state patrol stops. Um, here we have the gender of the driver, age of the driver, race of the driver. The violation um, for which the stop occurred. Here's a true-false column telling us whether a search was conducted. You see that searches were very rarely conducted and this is generally true across states, but if we scroll down enough we should be able to find a case where a search was in fact conducted. Here's such a case. Search conducted is set to true. We can look at the search type column and see that it was a consent search. We can look at whether contraband was found as a result of the search and see that it wasn't. And we can look at the outcome of a stop, which in this case was a summons, and whether the driver was arrested. No, they weren't. These are the columns which you will see occurring across all states, so they'll appear in the standardized file for every state. For each state, there may also be additional columns which are specific to that state and which we thought might be useful to other people. In the case of this state, you see that there's an officer ID column and also the duration of the stop. Cool. So now that we've gotten a sense of the data, let's do some analysis on it. We need to start by applying the same filters that we did in our analysis. Specifically, we filter for white, black, and Hispanic drivers in stop years between 2011 and 2015. That filters out about 8,000 rows. Now we're going to define a function which computes some basic summary statistics on this data, just to give you a sense of statistics that we're often interested in. So this function is going to take two arguments, a vector that tells us whether a search was conducted for each stop, and a vector that tells us whether contraband was found for each stop. These are just the same true-false columns you saw in the data just a second ago. Now we're going to compute a couple of quantities from these vectors. First, the number of stops, that's just the length of the vector because each row corresponds to one stop. Second, the number of searches, we can get that by just adding up the search conducted vector because that's going to be true if and only if a search was conducted. And similarly, we can get the number of hits, in other words, the, num the number of times that contraband was found, simply by adding up the contraband found vector. Um, we can compute the search rate, that is, the fraction of times, uh, the fraction of the time that a search was conducted after a stop, and that's just the ratio of searches to stops. And we can also compute the hit rate, which is 
uh, the fraction of the time that contraband was found as a result of a search. And importantly, in some states, uh, search conducted and contraband found will occasionally be missing, so you'll have to do something like this in order to correctly compute the number of searches. But that's not the case in Connecticut, so for simplicity, we just leave it as it is. So we compute all these quantities and we return them in a data frame. Okay, so now that we've defined these uh, statistics, we can actually compute them broken down by group. In our analysis, we frequently focus on driver race. So let's start by just looking at these summary statistics computed uh, by each driver race separately for white, black, and Hispanic drivers separately. We're going to compute this. Now let's take a look at these basic summary statistics. Let's start by just taking a look at the search rate. So as you can see, the search rate for white drivers is two to three times lower than it is for black and Hispanic drivers. Black and Hispanic drivers are much more likely to be searched. This is a very consistent pattern that we observe across states. Connecticut is no outlier in this regard. Now it's important to note that this disparity is, is very important to, to, to note because it indicates that policing practices are having a disparate impact upon minority communities. But this disparity on its own does not prove that the police are being discriminatory. Perhaps they're simply searching for contraband and some races are more likely to carry contraband than others. So disparate impact is important, but does not on its own prove discrimination. A second quantity we're often interested in is the hit rate. That is, the fraction of the time that searches actually find contraband. So what we see here is that the hit rate is considerably higher for white drivers than it is for black and Hispanic drivers. For white drivers, it's about 38%, whereas for black and Hispanic drivers, it's under 30%. This is what we call the outcome test, which is a test that's used to search for discrimination and has been used for several decades. The basic idea is that if searches of minority drivers are less likely to be successful, that can indicate that minority drivers are being searched when they're less likely to actually be carrying contraband suggesting discriminatory search standards. In other words, that minority drivers are searched at a lower threshold of evidence. So in general, when we observe this combination of higher search rates for minority drivers combined with lower hit rates, that's kind of a classic sign of discrimination, a classic sign that minority drivers are being searched on the basis of less evidence. Importantly, though, it's not the only uh, way that discrimination can manifest, and I'll talk about that a little more below. You don't necessarily need lower hit rates and higher search rates in order for discrimination to be occurring. Now, race, of course, is not the only thing you could stratify by. Let's just take a look at those same summary statistics broken down by gender instead. So when we look at this broken down by gender, the first interesting thing we observe is that there are a lot more stops of male drivers than of female drivers, possibly suggesting that male drivers are more likely than female drivers to be stopped. Now looking at the search rate, we see that the search rate is much higher for male drivers than for female drivers. But the hit rate, there's no real disparity in hit rates across the two genders. Now another thing we can do is we can break things down by both race and location. Specifically for location here, we're going to use the county. This is important to do because search rates and hit rates can vary by location for legitimate reasons. So for example, maybe there are different policing practices in different counties or different you know, police departments have different amounts of resources or residents of different counties are demanding different levels of enforcement. Like there are a million legitimate reasons that search and hit rates might vary by county. And because racial composition can also vary by county, uh, county heterogeneity can produce a correlation between race and search rate or hit rate. So what we really want to do is see whether search and hit rates differ by race even when we control for location. So that's what this does. It breaks it down by both race and county. Now we can just take a quick look at this data frame. And so here you see each row here corresponds to one race county pair. But of course, it's, it's a little difficult to get a sense of this simply by eyeballing a data frame of numbers. So let's actually make a scatter plot. Specifically, we're going to make a plot where each point shows us the search rate or the hit rate for each race and county pair. So in order to do this, we have to rearrange this data a little bit. Let's take a look at the rearranged data, which we're going to plot. So now you see each row compares the search rate and the hit rate for white drivers to the search rate and the hit rate for minority drivers. Here we have it for black drivers. And if we scroll down more, we would see 
comparisons for white versus Hispanic drivers, and each row here corresponds to one county. So let's actually make this plot. First I'll make the plot, then I'll talk a little bit about how it was made. Okay. So each point here shows the search rate for one county. So on the x-axis, we plot the search rate for white drivers, and on the y-axis, we plot the search rate for minority drivers. On the left, for black drivers, and on the right, for Hispanic drivers. So the diagonal line indicates equality between white and minority drivers. So if all the points were on the diagonal line, that would indicate equal search rates. But what you see is that all the points are above the diagonal line, indicating that there are higher search rates for minority drivers, even when we control for county, even within the same location. So that pattern of higher search rates for minority drivers that we were observing before is not simply the product of variation across counties. We can just talk briefly about how we made this plot. We used ggplot, and on the x-axis we're plotting the search rate for white drivers, y-axis is search rate for minority drivers, and we're sizing the points by the number of stops for minority drivers in that county. Now we can do the exact same thing for hit rates. And now we see the pattern is strikingly different. Before, the points were all above the diagonal line, and now they're mostly below the diagonal line. So while search rates for minority drivers are consistently higher even when we control for county, hit rates for minority drivers are generally lower when we control for county. So the patterns that we were observing before of higher search rates and lower hit rates remain consistent for minority drivers even when we control for counties. Now the outcome test has been used for decades, but it isn't perfect, and I want to take a moment to talk about why. It's because of a subtle statistical problem known as inframarginality, and the result of this problem is that the outcome test can tell you there's discrimination when there actually isn't any, and it can also make the opposite mistake. So to illustrate this, I'm going to use a hypothetical example. This is purely hypothetical, not real data. Imagine in this hypothetical world that there are only two races of drivers, white drivers and black drivers. And further imagine that there are two types of white drivers, those who are super unlikely to carry contraband, have only a 1% chance of carrying contraband, and those who are quite likely to carry it, have a 75% chance of carrying contraband. Similarly, there are two types of black drivers, those with a 1% chance, and those with a 50% chance of carrying contraband. Now importantly, in this hypothetical world, the police are not being discriminatory. They search all drivers if they are more than 10% likely to carry contraband. So they apply the same threshold to all drivers, regardless of their race. Now what will happen in this hypothetical world? When the police apply this equal threshold to both races, they'll search all the white drivers who are 75% likely to be carrying contraband, and all the black drivers who are 50% likely to be carrying contraband. And they won't search the 1% drivers of either race because they're below the threshold. So what will happen to the hit rates then? is that the white hit rate will be 75%, and the black hit rate will be only 50%. So the outcome test will look at these different hit rates and say, there's discrimination occurring there, even though, by hypothesis, the police are applying equal thresholds to both races. So in that hypothetical example, the outcome test found discrimination even though the police were applying equal thresholds because of the problem of inframarginality. You can also have the opposite problem, where the outcome test concludes that there is no discrimination even though the police aren't applying the same threshold. A more detailed discussion of this problem is beyond the scope of this tutorial, but if you want to read a paper on it, uh, see this paper by our collaborators, which also discusses a solution to the problem of inframarginality known as the threshold test. Now we're going to return to write a little more code. So another basic technique I want to illustrate that you might want to apply to this data is how to perform a regression. So a regression is useful if you want to examine, for example, search rates controlling for multiple factors simultaneously. So you don't just want to control for driver race, you want to control for driver race and a whole bunch of other things. Now in the county plot that we made, we actually, you know, we are controlling for multiple factors simultaneously. We're controlling for county and race, but if you want to control for five different factors simultaneously, it's quite difficult to illustrate that using a scatter plot. so regression is a natural technique. So in this regression, we're going to control for race, age, gender, and county simultaneously. And in order to do this, we're first going to compute some summary statistics. Let's just take a look at these summary statistics. So what we've done here is first we compute 
an accessory variable where we take the raw driver age, which is this continuous variable, uh, and we break it down into categories just to make it easier to interpret. So we break it into these age categories. Another thing we're going to do is we're going to set the driver race as a factor. The reason we do this is so that minority drivers are compared to white drivers, allowing us to observe disparity directly. And finally, we're going to apply a group by where we group by all the things we want to run the regression on, and we're going to compute the same summary statistics as before. So we can take a look at the actual data frame which is produced as a result of this. You see that each row in this data frame is the statistics for one grouping, so for one category. Um, and this is a lot easier to perform a regression on than the original data because you'll notice it only has 285 rows. So that means computationally it's much faster to do computations on this data than the original data. So the way we actually do this is we use GLM and the left-hand side of this is the number of positive examples and the number of negative examples. And this is actually identical mathematically to doing a logistic regression, but it's much faster computationally because rather than analyzing a data frame of 300,000 rows, we're analyzing a data frame with roughly 300 rows. So when we run this, it runs pretty much instantaneously. This becomes a big deal when you're running something with a lot of covariates or a lot more rows. For example, if you're trying to analyze Texas with you know, 23 million stops and potentially hundreds of counties, that's going to be much, much faster if you do it this way. Let's just print out a summary of the model. And so here we can see the effect of the different factors upon the search rate. The first thing we see is that black and Hispanic drivers are searched at higher rates than white drivers, just as we saw before, even when we control for these other factors. Second thing we see is that search rate generally declines as age increases. So the base category here is drivers who are 16 to 19, and you see that it goes down as the driver gets older. We also see that male drivers are searched at higher rates than female drivers. That was the same thing we observed before. And finally, we observe that there is significant variation across county. These, these coefficients are quite different than zero. So that's how to perform a regression on this data. So today we've run through how you might compute search rate, hit rate, break that down by various groups, actually make a plot showing it broken down by both race and location. We've discussed some of the problems in just looking at search rate and hit rate as tests for discrimination. Um, and then we've also shown how to perform a regression, where we look at multiple factors at once. So that's how you perform basic analyses for a single state. But as you can see, the data is very rich and complicated. There are a whole bunch of different things you could do, and a whole bunch of things we haven't even looked at yet. So we're really excited to see what you come up with. Um, a final thing to note, so what if you want to go beyond Connecticut? You want to scale up and analyze multiple states. We analyze Connecticut here to make things easy and quick but you'll find that a lot of states take a lot longer to load in, and if you try to load in dozens of states at once, it's going to take you about 20 minutes to even get started loading in the data. So it's going to be much faster to, rather than working with the raw data, to work with aggregate statistics of the data, and we've illustrated in this tutorial how you might compute those aggregate statistics. So, for example, if you wanted to look at national statistics broken down by age, race, and gender, you could start by simply computing those aggregate statistics for each state, saving them for each state, and then when you want to do analysis, you can just load in those aggregate statistics, which is going to happen almost instantly, as opposed to having to wait 20 minutes in order to get started. So that's how to do analyses that scale across multiple states, and we're really excited to see what you'll come up with.